Over 2,000 years, it's evolved into one of the world's largest cities, a modern metropolis on a massive scale. London. London is the product of massive feats of engineering and construction, from railways to bridges to cathedrals to skyscrapers. Scientific innovation has helped London grow, often in the face of catastrophe. Now the city faces its greatest challenge, from the river on which it was founded, the Thames. Since Roman times, the Thames has given London its reason to be, and the city has prospered. But the river that has nurtured London holds the power to bring disaster, unless science can tame it. This is the story of the people and events that built this great city. But this is no ordinary city. London dominates southern England. The city covers a massive 600 square miles. Every day, over 8 million people who live and work here make 27 million journeys on 8,000 miles of roads, using over 600 miles of railway and subway and crossing 30 bridges. But London couldn't be London today without its river. The Thames is a massive 215 miles long and up to 114 feet deep. It's London's artery, connecting the city with the rest of the world. The story of London and its river begins some 2,000 years ago. In 43 AD, Roman legions marched through southern England with a mission to conquer Britain. The Roman Emperor Claudius had sent 40,000 troops to quell the native Britons and establish a military base in the country. The Romans were quick to spot the strategic potential of the River Thames. On the hills of the northern bank, they established a supply depot for their troops. London was born. But all this changed in 60 AD. The British Queen, Boudicca, swept through southern England, avenging the rape of her daughters at the hands of renegade Roman troops. After less than 20 years of prosperity, London was destroyed. It is Second time around, the Romans built more wisely. Archaeologists have uncovered a fabulous piece of Roman engineering, a giant city-wide wall. What makes the wall significant is that it's made of stone, not wood. The London Wall not only provided defence, its construction defined London's evolution from a town to a city. By 250 AD, London was home to 30,000 people. The city wall enclosed an area of over 300 acres. It defined the boundary of a planned and ordered city, a city with a grid of streets and imposing public buildings. For 200 years, the city lived through its first age, then, in 410 AD, the Romans abandoned London as their empire fell. Without the Romans' commercial network, London fell into decline. But with its geographical advantages and mighty defences, it remained an attractive base for new rulers. In time, the abandoned city came back to life, and by the 11th century, it became the site for the country's royal government. Medieval London had prospered thanks to its international trade, but the river was also to bring disaster. In 
the winter of 1348, visiting ships arrived with a deadly cargo. Black rats carrying the bubonic plague infested the city. The rats quickly spread the untreatable disease. Once infected, the victims had no chance. It was a quick death, but not quick enough. And it was an, an ugly death. Uh, they could be well at breakfast and dead by lunchtime. Their bodies would develop swellings, they would vomit blood, and they might become delirious. <coughs> The plague cut a swathe through the city, killing an estimated 30,000 people, a third of London's population. The plague remained a constant companion in London's streets and alleys, returning frequently in the years to come. Only one thing, it turns out, could stop it. Fire. In the 17th century, London's population reached 200,000. The city's medieval layout remained essentially the same, only more dense. The wooden buildings more tightly packed, the city more polluted and overcrowded. It was a recipe for the biggest disaster to strike London since the Black Death. On Sunday, September the 2nd, 1666, sometime after midnight, in London's Pudding Lane, baker Thomas Farriner went to bed. He was certain he'd extinguished the embers in his ovens. But Farriner was wrong. It was the end of a hot and dry summer. Strong winds from the river fanned the flames. The densely packed timber houses burned easily. In five days of mayhem, 13,000 houses were destroyed. 80,000 people made homeless. Only the presence of the River Thames stopped the fire spreading further. The Great Fire finally rid the city of the rats which had been spreading the plague through London streets since medieval times. But this cleansing came at a terrible price. Nearly 400 acres of the capital lay in ruins. Many Londoners left and the entire city centre had to be rebuilt. Cramped or not, as the 17th and 18th centuries progressed, London continued to grow both in size and wealth. By 1801, with almost a million residents, London was by far the biggest city in Europe. Foreign trade reached a peak with the birth of the British Empire. The port of London was now inundated with tea from India, silk from China, spices from the East Indies. But more than just increasing the size of London, the docks also generated vast wealth for the city. Banks, insurance companies and commodity exchanges all grew up on the trade coming in and out of the port. By the middle of the 19th century, London was already a world-class metropolis. But sewage dumped in the river polluted the city's water supply and helped the spread of a deadly disease. Cholera. In 1848, an epidemic claimed no less than 14,000 lives. A decade later, in June 1858, the smell from the sewage, known as the Great Stink, became so bad Parliament was evacuated. The government was forced to act. As with the Great Fire two centuries before, crisis in London once again threw up a man of vision. This time, it was civil engineer Joseph Bazalgette. Bazalgette was chief engineer of the Metropolitan Board of Works, the body that oversaw the construction of public buildings in London. He had a plan to end London's public health problem, channel the sewage through a network of underground tunnels to purpose-built pumping stations safely outside the city. Bazalgette's sewer system changed the face of London forever. Indeed, it's still in use today. Its scale is extraordinary. A thousand tunnels feed a network of main sewers. 
Bazalgette's efforts paid off. London's sewage system opened in 1865 and was an overnight sensation. Thanks to Bazalgette, Londoners enjoyed better health and a cleaner environment. But the city's engineers now faced a new challenge. London's docks had brought such vast expansion to the east of the city that a new river crossing was urgently needed. But any new bridge had to allow ships to reach the heart of London. The city ran a competition, and the winning design is today perhaps the city's most distinctive symbol, Tower Bridge. The bridge owes a lot to its medieval predecessor, London Bridge, with its starlings and elaborate twin towers that give the bridge its name. The genius of the design is that the bridge can act as a gateway, swinging open to allow tall ships to pass through. Stand by, bridge staff. Stopping road traffic. Eight years in the making, the bridge contains 11,000 tonnes of steel clad in Cornish granite and Portland stone. Magnificent steam-pumping engines and boilers generated the energy for the massive counterweights which lift the bridge open in just one minute. While Tower Bridge helped ease congestion in the east of the city, the rest of London was suffering. With a swelling population and large numbers of commuters, traffic in the mid-19th century was as heavy as it is today. The solution lay not on the streets, but beneath them, with the construction of the world's first underground railway system. This station in central London is in one of the original deep-level tunnels which formed part of the Piccadilly line. It's now unused, but the decaying walls reveal the secrets behind its construction. The remarkable thing about this tunnel is you can actually see very clearly the constructional techniques used to build it. It's entirely circular, unlike traditional Victorian tunnels, which tend to be horseshoe or bell-shaped, which gives the name the tube, because that's effectively what you're standing in, a giant cast-iron-lined tube under London. It's been called the tube ever since. London continued to grow as the tube was extended to the suburbs and the city could accommodate millions more workers. Between 1921 and 1931, the city's size virtually doubled as a result of the tube's expansion. But as the decades of the 20th century rolled on, events soon cast a giant shadow over the whole city. War. The year 1940, midway through the Battle of Britain, German warplanes headed for London. The bombers struck first at the city's commercial heart, the docks. Day and night, they unloaded their deadly cargo of high explosives on the warehouses along the Thames. But the docks were not the only target. Soon, the whole of London was suffering a nightly assault, known as the Blitz. To those who lived through it, not only was the city under attack, but its 2,000 years of history. The effect on the morale of the people of the Blitz itself was devastating. Some people reacted like heroes, some people went down into the underground shelters and the authorities feared they'd never come out again. By the end of the war in 1945, one third of London lay in ruins, prompting the city's biggest rebuilding program since the Great Fire, almost 300 years earlier. London is Britain's phoenix. War, fire, disease, flood. No matter what fate throws at it, the city always rises again. Central to its survival are timely innovations in science and engineering. And structures like the London Eye, the world's largest observation wheel, epitomize this spirit. London's final challenge remains the taming of its ever-powerful river. 
But for now, its 8 million citizens can preserve their 2,000 years of history and celebrate the people who built this city.